How are you? No, really, how are you? How many times a day does someone ask you that question? How many times a day do you ask it? And how many times a day do we mean it? Supporting one another, really supporting one another, takes hard work. It takes investment, and it takes love. And when I was a kid, I would have given anything for someone to invest in me, to ask me that question and really mean it. There's this photograph in my parents' house. I'm three years old. Next to me are my three older brothers and my dad. They're holding up a huge fish that they caught, big smiles on their faces, super excited to be dirty boys playing outside. But me? I'm over in the corner wearing plaid shorts and a matching shirt with a disgusted look on my face. A lot has happened with my family since then, so a lot goes through my head when I see that picture. But one of them is, how in the world did they not know that I'm gay? I mean, you don't have to fit any stereotype if you're gay, but hello, I clearly fit a queer stereotype. By the time that cute, matching three-year-old kid turned into an ambitious 17-year-old high school junior, I was working three jobs. I registered for dual enrollment college courses, I joined every honor society, and joined every club that I could fit into my schedule. Every day I went from class, from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m., then I went to swim practice, then to a club meeting, then to my first job, and then to a second. And then I stayed up all night and I did homework. But I didn't do it all just because I loved taking classes or because I loved every activity I was involved in. I did it because I hated coming home. Home was a tense place, and I was often the target of that tension. You know, I can remember coming home one day, I turned to my neighborhood, and I just burst into tears. I didn't want to go home. I was often the target of that tension. My plaid shorts and shirts might have matched, but the boy who wore them clashed with my family. We had different beliefs about queerness and identity, about religion and about politics. I've heard bad words about queer folks in my home for as long as I can remember. My mother and grandmother would call queer folks funny. That was their word for it. And they would scrunch their faces the same way I do when I eat broccoli. My dad would scream faggot at the TV. Their revulsion to queer folk was a part of their physical beings, so much so that my dad made it clear that he would never accept a blood donation from a gay man. But as we all get older, our world gets bigger than the confines of our home. I started learning from my classmates and my teachers and my own lived experiences, and over time, I started questioning my family's beliefs. Where do those beliefs come from? How does that kind of hatred poison someone? For my family, it came from church. And I know not every church is like theirs, and for that, I am so grateful. But at my family's church, they decided to hire a new pastor one day. And this pastor felt it necessary to impose his beliefs on others. You know, it wasn't just his racism and homophobia and warped view of religion that terrified me. It was this man worked day in and day out to spread that misguided gospel. One day while in, in class, or excuse me, while in church, I was listening to this man and he started preaching about how children must obey their parents even if they're being abused. I was terrified. And I went home and I talked to my parents and I said, can I please go to any other church? They refused. My dad then gave me a choice. He said, you can go to church with us or you can move out. He looked me right in the eyes and said, I'm not compromising. In fact, he said that the Bible gave him the right to stone me to death right then and there, just for disobeying. It wasn't just as a spectator in the pews, though. There was also conversion therapy. My parents sent me to a Christian counselor to turn me straight. Honey, let me tell you, that man clearly doesn't know how to do his job. You know, but after this confrontation with my parents, I was forced to move out at 17. I was on my own. I had $25 in my bank account, and I certainly wasn't ready to live on my own. However, 
I also was an ambitious kid. I was the nerd in the fifth grade who walked around at recess and talked about how I was going to be an astronaut when I grew up. It turns out today that I'm literally too tall to be an astronaut. Before this confrontation with my parents, I had applied to all of the top schools in the country and had received a scholarship to Georgetown University. I was so excited to attend, but when I opened my financial aid package, I soon realized that Georgetown was no longer an option. My financial aid package was based on my parents' income, and without their financial support, I could not attend college. I didn't have a school, I didn't have a home, and I felt like I didn't have a future. But I learned that I wasn't alone. Now, I don't want you to walk away from this talk thinking, dear God, that was an hour-long therapy session. I mean, I pay someone else three times a week for that. There is good news coming, and there are good people in this story. One of them is Jane Martin. She was my high school biology teacher. And one particularly rough day, I remember she walked by me and left a sticky note on my desk. It said, I can tell you're not your normal self today. I'm here if you need anything. I love you. After I got kicked out, I desperately needed that love. Feeling directionless and just totally miserable, I needed someone to help me through these difficult times. So I turned to Jane. She started to go fund me, and she set the audacious goal of $20,000. I was so blown away when it reached $2,000. But I'm so happy to say that the GoFundMe closed off at over $141,000. And when a campaign does that well, people notice. My story got attention, and that attention led Georgetown to rethink its decision about my finances. I got to tell my story on national TV. Ellen DeGeneres gave me an additional $25,000 to start a scholarship for queer people in similar situations. It's called the Unbroken Horizons Scholarship Foundation, and I am so proud to say that we've already awarded our first five scholarships this year, and our work will not end there. Queer and trans people of color slip through the cracks of a system that is built to undermine them every day. We know that two of every five homeless youth identify as LGBTQ+. And we know that people of color make up a disproportionate amount of those homeless queer youth. But they and so many deserving kids don't get a big check on national TV. My vision for Unbroken Horizons is to help fix these systems of intersecting oppressions. The kids who are told they're wrong, or that they're going to hell, or that they're not good enough, we have to help them see that they can succeed and live their truth. We have to be there for people when they need help the most. Because the people who were supposed to be there for me, my family, my church, they weren't. I'm here because the world is bigger than that. My teachers, my coaches, my friends, even complete strangers became my family. They gave me hot meals and couches to sleep on. They made sure that I had a place to stay and a, place, a way to get to school. They heard my story and they decided other people should hear it too. And on that same list is TEDx Georgetown. I'm so glad that you all have given me the platform to share my story here today. We know that allyship begins when we listen to others. You know, I don't pretend that any of this is easy. These are difficult tasks, especially for a teenager, but Wading through, self, I mean, wading through hate and, and oppression is a collective journey, particularly for marginalized communities. You know, we must team up and support each other. We have to be there for other people. So that's what I want, ask, what I want to ask you. How are you? No, really. How are you? If you don't like the answer, it is completely okay to reach out and to ask for help. There is no shame in asking others for help. Remember, help takes two. It is totally okay. We have to let other people come in and help us out. And if you're good, if you don't need help right now, reach out to someone else and ask them. Be there for others. Support your friends in need. Real emotional support takes hard work. 
So that's what I want to leave you with today. How are you? No, really. How are you? Thank you.